So welcome both of you. I'm so happy to have you here and I'm happy to hear all about the Forenzi conference. It sounded amazing. Thank Thanks. you so much for the invitation. Yes. Who wants I'm to start? Tell thinking. me all about it. Well, I, it? I, can, I can start. <clears throat> I, I actually don't remember why or under what circumstances I decided to send in a proposal. Like, I can't remember what happened. I think I just saw an email uh, in my, you know, in my inbox about the conference, 150th anniversary of Ferenzi's birth. So a big one in Budapest. Hadn't left, you know, like my yard for three years because of COVID. So decided, <laughs> okay, that's it. I, I'm going to just th throw my hat in the ring. And I'd been thinking a lot about supervision and had uh, encountered the Budapest School of Supervision, which I thought was so interesting. And um, and so I'd been looking into that. What what the Budapest School of Supervision is, it's um, it sort of uh, takes the the, the, the the training analyst actually does the supervision as well for the candidate. They do both. So like four days a week, they're on the couch, the candidate, and then day five, they, they sit up and they face their training analyst and they are supervised. And of course, here in North America, we're so afraid of the teach treat division, you know, like we're so phobic about keeping those two things separate. Um, don't you never treat your supervisee, send them to, into their therapy be send them to analysis if they bring anything that's even slightly personal and so this was a really interesting place for me to kind of root around in and so I I proposed um a uh <clears throat> a, a case of my own case of over identification with a patient like really over identifying with a patient who was like so similar to me that I was hallucinating my face on the patient's face, stuff like that, you know, dreaming the patient's dreams. And so I workshopped this case with my peer supervision group, my group supervision, my supervision study group, and my analyst to find out what was going to happen when I started to talk about this and, and my life and the patient's life. And so that was what I proposed um, and so that was that what they accepted it. And because it's, you know, based on the Budapest model, and I hadn't really known much about the, the forensic groups, the folks, the forensic folks. Well, now I do, because they're um, a, a world apart from certain kinds of circles. They're very warm, very generous, very open. Um, and so my time in Budapest was amazing. Uh, just meeting all those folks and listening to papers and presenting a paper to a, um, you know, a, a very warm audience. And i um, really glad I went. This was June too. So Budapest is gorgeous in June. And uh, Maria, you'll know it was really beautiful weather and great food and great people. Um, so I'll go again for sure. Nice. What was your experience like, Maria? Well, first thing I want to say, Karen, I mean, your your presentation sounds fascinating. And, and I was taking a look at the program again to see what, what what panel were you part of. And then I realized we were both presenting at the same time <laughs> in this room. So that's why we never got to hear each other's presentation. But yeah, I totally agree with, with Karen's impressions about the warmth of, of people, which in a way makes me think of, of the warmth of Ferenczi and how in a way he was criticized sometimes for being too tender by his colleagues. Um, so I, I thought that was a, an, an interesting observation. And my my line of work um, was slightly different. I was reading a lot and teaching on uh, critical psychology for Still Point with um, an institute in, in Berlin, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, but um, very interested in, in critical psychology and identifying maybe the internal inconsistencies of psychoanalysis, importance of interdisciplinary work. Um, and I realized that Ferenczi was pretty much a, a critical psychologist in that sense, because he criticized the very same things that critical psychology um, suggests and criticized, right? The, the idea of a hyper-specialization, not working with other disciplines, 
um, you know, integrating feminist theory, which is something that Francie also did do, the, the feminist ethics of care. Um, a lot of criticisms like the analyzable patient, the non-analyzable patient. So I realized that all the criticisms that Francie had um, were pretty much along the lines of critical psychology. And when I saw that that was one of the potential topics, I thought, okay, let's let's do it. So that's when I presented and um, and it was a wonderful experience. Yes. So cool. Also, I love Still Point. Point. I'm so sad they're not around now. How did you, what was your work with them like? Um, amazing. I mean, it was such a broad audience, people from all walks of life. I learned so much. I mean, people from all over Europe, some people from South America. It was incredible. It was um such a such a nice environment so many different interests a lot of artists um yes i i taught once a month first it was a, a class on critical psychology then they turned it into psychology and society to make it a little bit more broad uh the videos are still in youtube what what the way the format worked is a, a half an hour video and then an hour or maybe less than an hour conversation and for members uh, of the steel pond community and it was it was lovely so cool yeah i never thought of forensi in this way as a critical psychologist and that's really true and i'm finding like i think i was saying before we started recording i was invited to speak at this auto wrong conference i've been reading a lot of wrong and i'm just like loving these analysts that were really yeah criticizing psychoanalysis and trying to take it further you know from the beginning you know Mm -hmm. absolutely another critic that that it's so so prevalent still the idea of uh whenever there's a stalemate or an impasse some classic theorists tend to blame it on the patient or what the patient it's you know there's an element of resistance and there's very little criticism on the analyst contribution to that impasse and for instance was one of the first ones to say it and that was one of the main uh, not the main, but one of the many reasons why he and Freud eventually parted ways. Everybody parted with Freud. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what happens <laughs> when you have such a strong father figure. <laughs> Everyone's going to have a rebellion and a split. <laughs> oh, yeah, the men. Yeah, the the, the men <laughs> had the fall. Not, not so much the women, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm true <laughs> did you go maria to the um to the to the party at Ferenzi's house yes i was just oh gonna ask you oh wow that was so moving for me to see some of the pages i mean i read his diaries i, I highly read anyone should read the diaries and yes. uh mm -hmm. some uh, some pages were on the walls of of his yeah. house so to be there on the anniversary in Budapest with people from all over the world, close to his work, it was it was an incredible experience. I assume you were there as well. I was, yes, being bitten by the mosquitoes that were, oh. I'm sure, the descendants of the mosquitoes that bit him. <laughs> um, you know, like what I'm saying is it was really nice to be in that proximity. It was the end of the conference, um, I think, the night before I was leaving and an outdoor garden party first, you know, milling about his old apartments and then into the garden. And, uh, you know, it was, again, with that wonderful crowd, so warm. Um, and I became, you know how you meet people sometimes and you become instant friends which is like my favorite thing ever in the whole world. And so, of course, that happens at conferences. And I met someone there, Patricia Vol. I think she's um, she's in, uh, uh, I can't remember. She was part of the Belgian, I think, um, uh, Institute Society. And we met and then walked all the way back to, you know, all the way back to the other side of the river and uh, together and have been friends since, you know, we met at that party um, talking about uh, Forenzi and conferences and everything else, art. Um, so it was, yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed some of the presentations. There were, there was a, a, a sort of a couple of presentations on Elizabeth Severn, which was really interesting to me. And she's being kind of 
um, revivified or brought back to life by a bunch of people. And a colleague of mine from Dublin, Fergal uh, Brady, who's the head of the Irish Psychoanalytic Society, he's writing a novel about Elizabeth Severn. So he was presenting. And um, so that was really nice. It was nice to see colleagues I hadn't seen in a long time. Yeah. That's so interesting. I've recently learned that like Freud's great, great granddaughter, Emily Freud writes fiction. And now I want to read her books and see like how psychoanalytic they are, because I think they're like detective horror stories kinds of things. Um, but I love like, yeah, either fiction about psychoanalysis or like with the figures in it, like the like the Freud show that was on Netflix. It was or, so or the- great. I yeah, loved I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Some people yeah. got really mad about it, but I thought it was so fun. <laughs> yeah, me too. Fun it with Freud. It to be yeah. realistic. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was realistic about it was his process of like figuring things out, his own, you know, detective mystery that he's trying to solve. And you actually see the core of his kind of trying to figure out what's going on in the unconscious that that I thought was really cool and um all all of the rest was was just fun pure fun mm-hmm. yeah it was just fun and if and if you want to recommend any of these people to come on the podcast I'd love to yeah you know, meet new networks and new people that are talking about these things mm-hmm. um because it sounds so interesting um was there any other ones that really grabbed you that you want to mention well, uh, just, just like you, Karen, I, I also made a group of friends from all over the world, uh, people that we clicked with immediately from Brazil, from Mexico, uh, from Sweden. Um, and I actually got to, to meet a lot of uh, organizations that are doing wonderful work. For example, in Brazil, we have Nebulosa Marginal, which is sort of like a clinic and an institute, um, very Winnicottian. Um, and I got to meet the, one of the main uh, staff members there. Um, and then also uh, the Project Freed Sci in London, which is a project on free clinics. Nice. Mm. Uh, that I highly recommend. For Luca Soriano, who was one of the keynote, uh, keynote speakers, it's part of the project. Mm. So it was not, a, not only an, a wonderful experience to meet colleagues, but, but to understand more about what they're doing with uh, all sorts of populations in, in different settings. And it's great what people are doing all over the world with psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, if you have links to those and you can send them to me, I would love to Definitely. link to them in the in the text at the end of the episode. Yeah, they actually did uh, an event recently at the Freud Museum. They had a hybrid event on uh, money and the economics of, of care. So mm-hmm. they were the co-organizers so yeah I I highly recommend that I'm gonna send you the link later yes wonderful yeah I'm huge obviously on like working sighting scale free clinics bringing psychoanalysis to the people super important I think all this bullshit about like who's analyzable and who's not is just that it's fucking bullshit (laughs) One thing that I'm curious, Karen, uh, what your impression was, right? I, I see in the U.S. so many pointless conversations about the turn to the social, the psychoanalytic turn to the social. Well, when, when did we turn away from the social, right? It, it, I, I don't think it's even up for debate. And, uh, and at this conference, that didn't even seem to be an issue. It's like, well, yes, the personal is political. It's all connected. There isn't such a thing as a turn to the social, but more in the interest it is more like why are we turning away from it and why are we thinking of it as as binaries as a false yeah. icon, right I don't know if, if you caught that spirit as well oh yeah I mean I I do th- I well we've seen what just happened with the American Psychoanalytic Association and um and the explosion there and the resignation of Carrie Sulkowitz because of this very um kind of binary that and I don't know I'm not sure what the fear is I mean Freud was talking about this stuff from the beginning Mm -hmm. do you know civilization and its discontents and um uh beyond the pleasure principle he's really thinking um about the social from the start and the idea that uh as an analyst said to me recently you know psychoanalysis has no truck with politics and I thought what how how is that that's so but it's a I think it's a generational thing a little bit 
-hmm. and, and also I think it is a modality orientation. So the relational orientation is much more uh, open to I think the social and the political and um, other orientations are try sort of much more focused on the the you know the consulting room and two people as if there are no politics as if there is no sort of outside you know forces uh, working on the unconscious of the of the patient it's it's a, it is very odd and mm. kind of not psychoanalytic in my in my yeah, view exactly you know. <laughs> Yeah, I also get confused by this, like the you know, all the listeners going crazy and like psychoanalysis isn't going to survive this and all of this. It's like, wait, but yeah, have you read Freud? And like, he lived through World War One and like the onset of World War Two and had to flee and like all these psychoanalysts like killed themselves and were killed and like, like, like right. it's always been very political. Like, <laughs> purged out of this precisely, not in in spite of the social, but because of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think well, it's also at the core of Ferenc's, uh thinking, right? He was one of the first people to work with trans populations. He was very um, in favor of democrat democratizing, if that's even a word, the patient therapist relationship. Right. Uh, very, very uh, cognizant and aware of the power dynamics. Right. And how that that gets uh, enacted in the in the room. So mm. in a way, for me preparing the presentation, in a way, felt like reinventing the wheel. Mm. So like, uh, and, and just spelling out, this is why, you know, feminist theory, critical theory, and forensic thinking align so well. But I think that relates to psychoanalysis as a whole to me. Um, mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely. Will you say a little bit about what, what, more about what you talked about, Maria? Uh, yeah, so um, it was more like a bullet point presentation of all the, the dialogues between uh, the implicit dialogue between critical psychology and uh, and, and Ferenczi. Um, the idea that he was seen like as an infant arrival of psychoanalysis and why that was, uh, why perhaps in the interest of the powers that be, his, his critical thinking was kind of uh, ostracized. Um, I also talked about, you know, concrete uh, examples of, you know, working with patients from low income or, or trans population, as I said, and and how that seemed scandalous to people in, in his circle. Also, the idea that, that he was a big proponent of integrating spirituality or, you know, other approaches. He kept saying psychoanalysis cannot exist in splendid isolation from other disciplines, um, which, again, Freud was not super happy about it. Um, so I talked about that, the emancipation from Freud. Um, and what, how did they break up? What happened? Well, um, <laughs> according to friends, you like <laughs> I love this juicy stuff. <laughs> well, there's a lot of it in, in, in his uh, diaries. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not like an archivist, so I, I, I would need to read a lot more to, to get my, more into like the, the details. But Ferenczi himself described uh, uh, his relationship with Freud as a blindly dependent son, which I thought was so interesting. And it was through his uh, criticisms, especially the one of, well, Freud, um, maybe it's not that the patient is resisting, maybe it's not that the patient is projecting, maybe it's you, maybe it's us, right? Or like with the Dora's case, for example. Um, and that's that was the beginning of the end, um, in a way. And there's this very you know powerful exchange of of letters and and a lot of comments in his diary that it's like a like a romantic breakup in a sense. Um, yeah. So I would I would direct you to the clinical diaries. Yeah, uh, I have the I have the letters. I have to get his diaries. Mm -hmm. I love reading that kind of stuff. I have like oh, yeah. lots of letters it between reads analysts. So well. yeah. <laughs> It's so fun. And of course, you know, the, the story has been told from, um, you know, sort of conventional psychoanalysis very differently that basically Ferenzi went mad. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> I can't remember. Young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he went crazy and that's why he broke with Freud. And that was, you know, and uh, and so that that's a kind of a typical story but uh, but 
people have been, you know, figuring out um, by going back to the letters and going back to the diaries and going back to people who were in the know uh, at the time to figure out exactly what what happened before that things were, yeah, um, falling apart. And I think it was hard for for Freud to to see someone again like Jung, like Rank go off book and do um be be creative the way that freud was but you know not in the way that he wanted them to be do you know like you, you were allowed to innovate but within a very st strict sort of um space from freud's perspective i think yeah as yeah. long as it like added to his ideas and then like challenge his ideas yeah <laughs> apparently yeah because <laughs> yeah, i've my whole like analytic career like 15 years or whatever i've been like why do these institutes just keep splitting and splitting and splitting and like have these like really strong divides and like they will not talk to each other and like what is that it's so unpsychoanalytic but now it's like obviously this is like a remnant of like freud and all of his colleagues that all ended up splitting offices it's like we have like the part of psychoanalysis that's really like this should work for everyone and every way of being in the world is equally valid and wonderful or whatever <laughs> and then we have the psychoanalysis that's just like nope split 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 it has right. to be like the master or else no <laughs> yes and I think Ferenczi, uh, what made him also additionally controversial is that he not, he not only wrote about the clinical work but about psychoanalytic education Mm -hmm. and and how um actually i think i have an excerpt here that i, I love um yeah uh in psychoanalysis and education he said liberation from unnecessary inner compulsion would be the first revolution to bring real life to mankind uh, to bring real relief to mankind only people liberated in this real sense will be able to bring about a radical change in education and prevent permanently the return of similar undesirable circumstances. So he's already talking about the ways in which we analysts repeat in the educational arena and the clinical arena. Um, and he talked also about how in order to imagine a revolution, it has to start from within. We have to represent it in our minds first. Um, and I think it's a very appropriate read for our times. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. Where is that? Uh, in uh, psychoanalysis and education. Oh, great. Yeah, so he's talking about this back then. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Things really haven't changed much. <laughs> well, and he's clearly thinking politically and Absolutely. socially. He's, he's clearly, when he's using the term revolution at that time, I mean, look what's happening in Europe and so on. He's definitely thinking about the effect of society on the individual and on psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and on the training, that's so, super interesting. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah, Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about how what you presented too? I know it was like personal and talking about patient, but maybe some insights you gleaned about this kind of identification or something like that? Well, I was, I, I, of course I, I got to figure out a lot about the work with this patient in workshopping <laughs> with all those groups that I was telling you about and then writing it up. Um, the most helpful person actually was the, aside from my analyst, of course, was um, was the, the, the person who heads my supervision study group, Josh Levy. He's a real treasure here at the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society. He's been um, teaching and supervising a tr as a training analyst for decades and decades and decades. And, um, and so he was very helpful. He's a former supervisor of mine. But I guess what I was really interested in was this split, the, the binary, this, this idea that for some people, when I started in these groups to talk about my own identifications from my own history, um, that people people's backs not everyone half half people's backs got up and they would they would freeze and they would get anxious all this this flurry of anxiety would come up and they you could see that they just they, they didn't want to know that and and then and then another the other side would go oh that's really interesting you know tell me more oh that was hard for you and do you know so it was this split in each group between the sort of conventional and the 
like let's just be thinking together and in this work that we do how can we ever divide the personal from the professional like our very person is our instrument mm -hmm. you know and that i think is what forenzi knew and understood i wasn't advocating i guess for you know um training analysts to both analyze and supervise i think there are complications with that model um, but I was trying to advocate, I guess, for um, for people to not shame supervisees by trying saying to them, "Don't I don't want to know what about your personal life? That sounds like something you should bring to your analyst. Let's talk about this over here." That which has happened to me, and maybe it's happened to each of you, you know, where um, a supervisor gets uh, gets frightened by. Um, by that binary, I, I wanted to suggest to people to to listen really carefully, as we are meant to do as analysts, as supervisors. Listen, if the supervisee is coming to you for therapy, you'll know. You'll you'll know. So try not to put the boundary way too close to you. Do you know like um, and uh, and be a little bit more empathetic to uh, to how complex this work is because we're using our very self uh in it yeah yeah absolutely I mean I can't imagine I mean my last supervisor I had I just loved him and I was very able to talk about personal things and how it affected or how I was seeing something because of something I experienced and I really appreciated being able to bring that in because of course it's like affecting <laughs> your experience or bringing things up for you like maybe something that's happening with your analysis and bringing something up for you you know something like that so of yeah. course it's like you can't have too much of this like strong divide and if someone is like consistently using supervision kind of as analysis or therapy like maybe talk about that like what's going on in their analysis like maybe that is maybe they, there's something they feel they can't share there or maybe just help them like look at that like what what is going on that you feel like you can bring this here but maybe not there or maybe you're bringing it everywhere or something that's like overwhelming who knows you yeah know? And, and in the end, what I discovered through this whole process, including presenting at the conference was, okay, yes, I have this weird, these weird things that are happening, this over-identification, I was calling it over-identification with the patient. But in fact, just to kind of, because I, you know, you get worried that if you're, if you're really identifying with a patient that you might be blind to something, you might be missing something, or if things happen that don't happen in other, with other um, treatments, then there's something to look at. But, you know, again and again, I got the message and finally accepted the message that maybe my identification with the patient could be helpful in the service of treatment and that it would you know that it was something a, a a way of the patient kind of being de facto understood from uh, from the get-go you know d d understood out the gate and then you know um and then we would work more deeply to find uh to find out more but maybe the reason that she kept coming and the work was rich which which it is is because you know we we shared so much in common culturally, for example, um, economic, socioeconomically, uh, familially, you know. So I always find it interesting too, and it makes me wonder, like, how big is the unconscious? Because sometimes I've had analysis come in that is like when they start talking, they've had experiences that are like so similar that I'm like, you know, you're not going to find every analyst that's had this experience. And like, how did they find me? Because it's not like something I'm talking about out there, you know? And it's like somehow like the unconscious, like found this other unconscious that like will understand this kind of experience that most other people won't, you know? <laughs> I find that really interesting how that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had the same experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and, and uh, far instead of being frightened of it, worried about it, you know, embrace it, and uh, and use it. Yeah, um, use it in the treatment. You don't necessarily need to be like, "Hey, I've had that too," but but uh, but you know that you have, and maybe and and that transmits in other ways. You know, it must. It absolutely must. Yeah. Super mm -hmm. interesting. Where do we go from here? Well, I I I have a ghost story. Ooh, tell a, a forensic conference <laughs> ghost story. So the if you if you are open to hearing my little, it's a family story. So I 
I don't, I, again, I'm not sure why I was compelled to go to this conference. Uh, I'm so glad I did. I do have one um, known uh, Hungarian ancestor. So that was kind of interesting. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to a city where my ancestor um, la departed from to go to New York in the 1890s. So the day after the day that I presented, you know, at the end of the day, I'm revved. I can't sleep. It's jet lag. So I do what I always do to self-soothe. And I Google, started researching and I decided that I was going to find out more about this Hungarian ancestor. I know his name. I've seen his birth records. My aunt, um, Sandy, uh, who was named after him, um, she, uh, she's done a lot of family research. So she and I were sending documents back and forth. And I'd seen Andre Takacs's, um, you know, baptism record before, like the transcription, but I'd never looked at the document. So there I am, it's like midnight. I'm looking at the actual document. My, my grandmother, my great grandmother, it was her dad. She always said that he was a count, which I never believed. Um, but uh, he was a, a designer of sheet music covers in early New York, Tin Pan Alley. And they're amazing. I have a bunch of them. They're like Art Deco and just gorgeous. Uh, he died when he was 39, uh, apparently of a heart attack on his way to Knickerbocker Hospital. That's all I really knew about him. And he was Hungarian and maybe a count. And so I was looking up his data and I looked at the actual original document and I saw his godparents' names and I looked them up. And so my aunt and I are passing back and forth from Toronto and Budapest, these documents and these Google hacky translations. And we come up with um, the fact that his dad, his father was a doctor, not only just a doctor, but he was a neurologist. And he was the chief physician at the Budapest Hospital, the uh, St. Elizabeth and the, um, the other hospital, both of which I had learned that day that Ferenzi was at. Yes. And, and, so, and he's a neurologist. And in his little Wikipedia, because um, he has a Wikipedia, he's not only ennobled, so the Count story was a little bit true, um, but also he had written a paper on neurasthenia in the 1890s, right when Freud is writing about neurasthenia. So I'm thinking, what the hell? Like, this is so weird. And then I looked at the, there was a footnote that his wife had committed suicide. So my, my ancestress had committed suicide years before he wrote this paper on neurasthenia. And that weekend there were free, there was a free subscription to the newspaper, the Hungarian newspaper that had an article about her suicide. So wow. I was able to translate it. So this is happening in the middle of the night and it says, Suicide at Stein Palace. And I read the last days and hours and minutes of her life as she that morning says goodbye to her little babies, takes each on her lap, dons a black dress, a black veil, white gloves, goes down to the Danube, paces back and forth. This is 1883. So my great gra grandfather is three at the time and his little sister is one. She climbs up to the roof of the Stein Palace, paces back and forth, her left leg, then her right leg, and she sails to the ground. At the, at the bottom, this is how descriptive it is. This newspaper article, it's like a novella. And, um, and then she breathes her last breath. And then there's this description of her, her beauty, her elegance, the king spoke to her last year at the ch ch women's charity bazaar. Like I, and she was depressed after the birth of her last baby. It said she was depressed, and so I thought, well, that's why he wrote that paper. I mean, for sure. Years later, and then my aunt, I'm sending it back and forth, and she sends me a picture of the Stein Palace, and it says at the bottom. Now the site of the Intercontinental Hotel. Wow. Where am I? Uh, not only that, but I'm on the fourth floor, about at the height that wow. she would have jumped. I'm I'm meters away from where she she jumped. Wow. So that's my ghost story. I've been walking through her ghost to breakfast every day. 
And her husband basically becomes a proto psychoanalyst Mm. as a result of her suicide. So I'm just, I'm completely floored. And uh, my aunt and I are having a wonderful time actually. So I ended up getting his paper that he wrote and it took me a few weeks to get the paper um, on neurasthenia and to have it translated, which I did. And I am floored at some of the things that he says, including at the very end, he says, the thing to do, he says, we should demonstrate with our patients, not only sympathy, but above all interest in their illness which sounds to me like something Ferenzi would have said, you know, and probably they crossed paths, you know, he's a neurologist. He's at this, ho- the same hospitals that Ferenzi's at, at the end of his training. So I just right. thought it was, such a rem- it was such a remarkable thing to have happened and explains maybe something about why I'm a psychoanalyst, you know? And why you had to go to Budapest. I love that kind of ancestral pull. It's so strong. And I it's love so, that you like went with it, you know, be able to, like you have to go with those things. Paying attention. Like, yeah. I don't know why I'm doing this, but somehow, and then it all like all this stuff fits together. Next time That's you have that magic. feeling, you got you to gotta follow it. Look what this took you. It's something about the unconscious, right? It's something about that, the, the, the size of the unconscious. Something compelled me to do that thing that in that place at that time. Um, and, uh, and so I was feeling quite, uh, quite chuffed by the end of it and a little bit weirded out because as we all are with the uncanny. Yeah, but I love that stuff. And that's so like powerful. It's now like, she probably wants more people to know her story and I, you and your family to know her story and remember and the fact that you were in the same building in the same place. And that's, yeah, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's so healing too. I feel like it really helps to like, heal family lines when you're able to kind of bring these unconscious things back to the surface and into awareness like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, so that meant that my ancestor, his mother killed herself when he was three, he goes to the States after his father remarries and dies and marries a woman who will go on to commit suicide, Wow, which, you know, I didn't, I knew that, but I hadn't known that his mother, so his mother, and how did he know, how did he end up marrying someone who was a repetition of his mother who also left behind three little kids? you know so anyway very interesting no the unconscious is so powerful that way well repetition yeah Yeah. repetition and I have a similar thing with um people who died in fires my mother's father set a fire uh when he was like a teenager in his house in the garage and it killed his dad and his brother his little brother I didn't know that But then there's like other repetitions in the family of like people dying in fires, which is interesting as well. And that's how he ended up. He got like sent to military school after that because he was a problem child. Clearly, (laughs) he ended up like in the Air Force and like fighting Nazis and things. But um, so he's able to put that aggression to use, I guess. But it's just so interesting. It's like, how, how does this like fire thing, fire setting thing, like travel down through generations? Mm hmm. If it's not worked through, if it's not worked through, it will repeat. This is what Freud told us. Exactly. That's that's beyond the pleasure principle, right? Yeah, Yeah, it sure does. Because people don't know. He obviously didn't know that his wife was going to do that, you know, and somehow, somehow you just like connect with someone who, yeah. Has, has and then for the the additional question, which is what is psychoanalysis repeating? Mm Mm-hmm working with what what the patient repeats but with with what the discipline what the theory and the practice is repeating as well um and and another you know free association that i have while you're talking about women and and history i also wanted to recommend uh anna borger's work she wrote a book on the female psychoanalysis in the budapest school that was part of the panel that I was in that was on critical psychology and psychoanalysis. I'm going to send you the link. Yeah. That was the presentation that closed the panel and it was incredible. Mm. I'd love to see that. She brings to the fore all these women that, you know, previously unknown. That's yeah. wonderful. 
Who stands out among those women the most to you? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I didn't read the book and I don't have the notes on the presentation. I, I She mentioned three or four. Yeah. I can't remember one, a particular one off the top of my head, but um, let me see. I'm trying to remember the, the name of the book. Oh, it's called Women in the Budapest School of Psychoanalysis. <laughs> Girls of Tomorrow. I love that. Yeah, I mean, women were so instrumental in the early days, especially, I think, <laughs> like of innovating and, but they didn't always get the credit, right? No, um, no. And, and, and no, last name's difficult to, to remember. Let me see. Well, Alice Ballant. Yes. There was a lot of talk about Michael Ballant, definitely for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Makovax. Yeah, there's there's eight chapters, different portraits of, of female analysts. Nice. Michael, should be, should be yeah. Aware. Ballant was so important. The balance were so important in rescuing Ferenzi and in and in defending him from some of the the ter the spurious accusations against him and um telling the real story of what was going on yeah yeah i've and also realized like i had also internalized these like prejudices like oh for for young went crazy or wilhelm reich went crazy or whatever because it's like literally what they tell you in class you know <laughs> Like, oh, they, they're good. At, I mean, I also had someone at my psychoanalytic institute say Freud was good up until beyond the pleasure principle. And then when he came up with the death drive, he was obviously like going <laughs> insane. And I was like, really? But anyway, but yeah, I've purposely started like reading some Jung again and things like that to be like, why, why, why do I poo poo young? Like what, what happened? When did I start doing this? You know, I used to really like him when I was younger. And then I read it. Yeah. It's like, this is really fun to read. It's like, I might not be like, you know, let me think of the archetypes while I'm in a session, but like reading it and all the mythology. And I talked to a union analyst recently on the podcast and he said in their training, they read a lot of like mythology and fairy tales and religious texts and things like that, which obviously I didn't do in my training. Do so I thought that was really interesting too, because I always say that like you learn so much about human psychology through like, yeah, the polytheism and different mythology and things like that. So it's interesting that they actually focus on that in their training. So it's fun to see like what the different schools are doing instead of just like writing everyone off because it's not you know, what we were taught, you know? Well, we did read Ferenzi in my training, but we did not, not even touch Jung. No. We didn't touch him. Uh, not even the pre, you know, um, fallen, pre-crazy yeah. Jung, right? <laughs> so it, it <laughs> it's, so it's interesting, yeah. Um, well, Jung will have a lot to say about your story, Karen. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. For Nisili, I mean, that's a perfect for a Jungian read on it. Yeah, that's synchronicity. Like, yeah. in a nutshell, yeah, that's a story of synchronicity. Freud wouldn't know what to do with that story. You know. Yeah, and I think and and I think that kind of ancestral like memory is so important and is really key. I mean, like every everybody has that in their line. And that's why I think it's so, you know, it's so obviously tragic that people are torn from their homelands or like homelands and people are massacred on their homelands and things because it's kind of tied to your history and your roots. Um, it's really, yeah you can't replace that you Absolutely. know and so it's so interesting even though your ancestor like traveled across the world and settled somewhere else you were pulled back there you know by this it's like I love yeah. that it's incredible well, and I've actually, even found out like being in Sweden and stuff like growing up my dad's born in the Dominican Republic my mom's born in Alabama I'm in Miami so I'm just like that's my identity I'm from Miami and then I've been doing my ancestry and stuff I guess because I moved so I felt like dislocated and trying to root and then I find like even though my dad was born in Dominican Republic like his ancestors were like from Scotland and Ireland and Germany and I'm like what and then like tracing all this back and like then like back as far as I've gone it's like to this like islands between Norway and Scotland these like Orkney Islands and stuff oh, I was wow. like, Whoa. and then and then I had like I did the little DNA test thing and it was like you have 12 percent Scandinavian and I was like and, and then my husband was like well that's probably because the Scandinavians were like raiding that area you know so it's like so I'm like mm -hmm. I've like actually come back to an area where I have like a lot of DNA from and I had like didn't know this five years ago you know 
it's like I never even thought about this part of the world you know being from Miami so it's really interesting that's wonderful I'm learning a lot about that phenomena through my patients I would say 80 percent of the people that I work with are first generation uh adult children of immigrants from all over the world and yeah. even in those cases where they never visited their parents homeland there's so much that comes up that that it's more pertaining to their parents lived experience yeah. And it comes up with dreams and in so many and in their interests, in their life choices. Mm -hmm. It is it is an incredible thing to to observe. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And I remember my first analysis, and I'll never forget when she was like doing her, you know, four time a week analysis and really getting into it. There were so many like her fa family were survivors of the Holocaust, but she didn't know that growing up and they had changed their names so that she didn't even know they were Jewish. And like, then she started having these dreams and things like that. And just like ended up talking to her mom and her mom's like, okay, let me tell you, you know, <laughs> like just started piecing all these things together. That was just like, it was absolutely fascinating to see how it all came up and how like this like ancestry and like historical, like family trauma needed to be known, you know, instead of like denied. And obviously it's denied for like survival reasons, but it was just so interesting when she was in a safe space and could re reconnect with all of that, you know, she was able to bring it up and like talk to her mother and, and connect. And then she could understand like her mother's alcohol abuse more and things like that. It's just like, oh, she's like not dealing with this trauma, this real trauma that she had. And it was mm -hmm. super fascinating. Yeah, I, I definitely see this not only in, uh, you know, sort of Holocaust, but all kinds of you know, especially China, because uh, I have a lot of um, East Asian patients and uh, and I'm see I see, you know, like Mao, <laughs> you, their, their families fled China at a certain time. And, and you see the effects of sort of Maoist China, the cultural revolution coming through in, in you know, 20 somethings where they haven't even they don't know anything about it. And then they start to become curious and they learn, oh, they understand so much about themselves and their families by what wasn't spoken, but what was political, so political. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Well, I know we have nine minutes left, and I know everyone has something at the next hour. Is there anything that we didn't get to that you wanted to bring up? I definitely want you just send people to me who you think would be interesting for the podcast and send me any links you'd like me to link to because I would love to dive into all of this. Will do. Karen, are you going to Brazil to the to the next conference? I'm so tempted. I keep getting oh, the email. Brazil, you just, have to like, go. It's a real scenario, <laughs> the next one. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, like you, it, you, you become a little bit of um, a forensiteite. You know, once yeah. you once you engage with not just the ideas and his writings, which, of course, I bought like a bunch more books after the conference, but with the community, we have a um, great uh, fellow here, Andre Coritar in uh, British Columbia, who I met, uh, I think, at the IPA, but we'd both been at the <laughs> Forensic Conference and hadn't met each other. And so I, th I know he's going. And, you know, folks like that. So it's sort of like now, now it's like, not only are you going for the ideas, but you're going for your community, you know, your friends, your, this okay. particular. A warm and supportive psychoanalytic community. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. amazing. Generous, <laughs> open. Yes. What's this about? I don't know. And, you know, it, it, for me, like I went to two institutes, we have a split here in, in Toronto. So my first institute that I did three years at was the Relational Institute. So Forenzi was very much the godfather of the relational movement here. But for a number of reasons, I switched institutes and started over at the other institute, which was considered the conventional or old school one. It's not, it, it used to be, but now it's been, you know, it's had to take a look at itself because of the split and become much more integrative. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I, I have had some uh, connection with, with, um, with Forensians, but not that this community, this particular community that puts on the events that has the discussion groups that has the study groups that that is really dedicated to his life and his work um being brought to the world and so yeah so maria you and i'll talk maybe we'll go and vanessa hey maybe you'll go oh, 
And also, I'm from Uruguay. They're a little far from Next Sweden, but I wish. <laughs> Next time it's in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would love to go to let's Brazil, go, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and then I'll do a tour for, in Uruguay, and, you know, we can meet also the Uruguayan psychoanalytic circle. You know, let's do two in one. Amazing. Oh, sounds interesting. Lots if going on. I was on. still in the States, Up I would there. be there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you yeah. for having us. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. It was nice meeting you, Maria. Nice seeing Likewise. you. Hope to see you in person in Brazil. Yes. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Good. We'll Bye. be in touch. Bye. Bye.